Hello there and welcome back to this course on bilingualism. This is already the last video, so in this session I would like to talk about neurolinguistics and specifically these three questions. How does the brain host two languages? Which brain structures are involved in processing the two languages that are at work in a bilingual speaker? Second, does learning a second language somehow change your brain? Does it rewire your brain? Does it make your brain different from the brain of a monolingual speaker? And third, if we switch from one language to another, does it mean that different areas of the brain are being activated as we're using one language and then another? All right, that's what we'll talk about. Uh, the ideas and the experiments that I'll discuss are described in more detail in chapter 10 of Courjean and Lee's The Psycholinguistics of Bilingualism. If you're interested in the details or you need to look up the references, go to the chapter. It's all in there. Right, so I need to start by pointing out a few things about different brain areas that are involved in language processing. Many of you will know this, but bear with me. So two areas that will come back again and again in this video are Broca's area and Wernicke's area. They're associated with different language functions, and we know a lot about these areas because of uh, specific language impairments that are associated with brain damage, with lesions to these areas. So if a speaker sustains brain damage to Broca's area, let's say because of a stroke, there is a specific set of symptoms that arises and that is called Broca's aphasia. So aphasia, that's a speech impairment, and Broca's aphasia is characterized by slow, effortful speech that's telegraphic, so it relies on individual words, typically high-frequency words, and smaller function words, the grammatical bits and pieces, uh, they are omitted more often than not. So there's a lack of grammatical markers, um, determiners, prepositions, pronouns. These things tend to get omitted. And uh, also word finding is severely impaired. So Broca's aphasic struggle to construct their utterances and what they get out is typically a sequence of lexical high-frequency items. Broca's aphasics tend to be aware of their speech deficit, so they know that something is not right, and this can be a very frustrating experience. And on the other hand, comprehension, the comprehension side of language, tends to be largely intact. So Broca's aphasics understand what it is that you're saying to them, but uh, they have problems producing language. So, um, But also processing is impaired to some extent with regard to syntactic structure, so structures that rely on these functional items that Broca's aphasics have difficulties with. So for instance, if you give a Broca's aphasic a sentence such as, this is the cat that the horse jumped on, a complex relative clause construction, and you ask them, well, who did the jumping? They have more difficulties figuring that out than a person without Broca's aphasia. So very specific set of symptoms associated with brain damage to a specific brain area. Um, with Wernicke's area, it's a different set of symptoms that arises. Um, so Wernicke's aphasics have poor auditory and reading comprehension. In severe cases, they can't even understand single words that you say. Speech, on the other hand, tends to be relatively fluent. So it sounds normal, except that it is disconnected from meaning. It tends to be semantically empty. It tends to be weird. And uh, another characteristic of Wernicke's aphasics is the use of paraphasias, that is the use of words that sound just about right. They follow the phonotactics of the respective languages, but they are not actual words. Unlike Broca's aphasics, Wernicke's aphasics tend to be unaware of their speech deficit. All right, so this just as a general primer of Broca's area and Wernicke's area and the symptoms that are associated with damage to these areas. <clears throat> when I talk about these areas, it reflects the idea that language tends to be localized in the brain. There tend to be language centers that are responsible for very specific language-related tasks. And this, of course, is true. But then again, the story is more complex than that. We have new evidence pointing to a more important role of connectivity between different areas. No language area does it alone. They have to work together, they have to be connected to make language work. And this means that language is not fully localized, um, not fully modularized, but rather we have different areas that are involved. And some of these are even non-cortical, that is, they don't sit on the outer shell of your brain, the, the cortex. 
And um, another thing is that actual aphasic patients rarely are perfectly clear cases of any one aphasia. So when I described Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia, I was giving you the stereotypical case. Um, in actual fact, no two aphasic patients are completely alike, kind of like bilinguals. You don't find any two bilinguals who are completely alike. Um, with aphasics, the symptoms may overlap, yeah? uh, but even in speakers with similar lesions, um, there may be differences because of, let's say, the different languages that are involved. So in the literature, there has been a trend to talk about brain organization rather than brain localization. Okay, let's come to our questions that are specific to bilingualism. Do bilinguals have a language switch that allows them to change from one language to another? Uh, Hernandez and colleagues did a study on Spanish-English bilinguals and they were using a picture naming task where you show people a picture and then you ask them what's the word for this in one language or in another language. So they see pictures of a puzzle, of a ladder, a ladybug, a lamp, or a lion, and they have to say the respective words in Spanish or in English, and they have to switch between different languages. What has been used in terms of neurolinguistic methodology here was an fMRI uh, design. fMRI stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, and if you were planning on doing an fMRI study in your living room uh, later today. I have to disappoint you. This only works with heavy machinery and expensive equipment. So you see an fMRI machine here. And what this machine allows you to do is to measure magnetic fields in the brain, uh, depending on the blood flow. So where in the brain you have a, um, a flow of fresh blood it comes in with much oxygen and it can be contrasted with the positions of used blood that has relatively less oxygen. So researchers talk about so-called bold signals, blood oxygen level dependent signals, and as people engage in cognitive tasks, fresh blood with lots of oxygen flows towards areas in the brain that are active in those specific tasks. So if you ask people to do a math problem or if you ask people to imagine the picture of a butterfly, um, you get different responses. You get fresh blood flowing towards different areas in the brain. Right. So mm, the, 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 the crucial way to do this is that fMRI allows you to compare um, levels of activity um, during a resting state on the one hand and a specific task on the other. So the resting state is kind of the average level of activity, the baseline of activity that you have at any given moment. So your brain is basically on standby, it's, it's doing its thing uh, all of the time. And the resting state is measured in such a way that you have participants and you tell them to think about, well, nothing in particular. Now, of course, you can't help thinking about something in particular, right? So every participant thinks about something different when you tell them that one person thinks about the grocery list, another person isn't sure whether they've locked the door, another person is thinking about a friend they're going to meet later that day, and so on and so forth. But on the whole, these different thoughts are going to cancel each other out. Yeah, so um, everybody thinks about something different, and that gives you the kind of baseline that you can compare something more specific against. So the specific task would be all of your participants using their brains for the same thing in the same way. And then this allows you to measure which brain areas are actually more active during the specific task as compared to this averaged out resting state. Uh, here are a few pictures that show the results of fMRI studies. Importantly, these pictures don't show the brain of any one particular person, but they are overlays of all the participants that have been averaged out. Yeah? So here we see an fMRI scan of uh, participants speaking words, and not surprisingly, we have a uh, Broca's area active, and we also have uh, a good chunk of the primary motor cortex active. The primary motor cortex uh, controls all your, your limbs and your muscles and your mouth and your articulators. They are part of that, a big part of that. Um, okay, so that's speaking words. That's very different from seeing words. When you show people words on a page, well, unsurprisingly, parts of the visual cortex that sits right in the back of your brain 
is highly active. In hearing words, well, the uh, primary auditory cortex is active and also Wernicke's area, which is um, associated with looking up words, connecting words, uh, sounds to the entries in the mental lexicon, and then looking up meanings of those words. That's what Wernicke's area is responsible for, and you see it's active here. Okay, um, so fMRI has excellent spatial resolution. It tells you more or less exactly where something happens, but on the downside, its temporal solution is less uh, excellent, so the blood flow takes some time, and it's not super discreet. So we're not sure exactly when something happens, but for a process such as speaking words, well, that takes a couple hundred milliseconds, so that's close enough. Right, coming back to Hernandez and the picture naming task. What people did was they saw a picture, so here you see a picture of a horse, and there was a sound indicating which language they should use. So if they heard say, well, they, this was a sign, use English, and people would say horse. Um, in another condition, so the condition that actually interested Hernandez and colleagues was a condition where you had one language first and then another. So let's say you hear the, you see the horse picture and you hear say, and then you see a picture of this and you hear diga. Um, I'm butchering Spanish, I'm sorry. Um, so here you're supposed to say nariz. Um, and um, again, sorry. And the question that Hernandez and colleagues wanted to answer is whether there's a brain region active when the language cue indicates a language switch, and they measured that via fMRI. Here are the results, and you see when you compare the alternating condition to the monolingual English condition, so two stimuli following each other, both of them are English. Uh, here we have two stimuli following each other, both of them are Spanish. You see that something's going on in the alternating condition. There's heightened activity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and uh, this could be interpreted with some goodwill as a language switch. So there's something going on telling you, okay, it was English, now it's Spanish, well, let's go. But of course it's more complicated than that. So the area that you see active there, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, is associated with something that I talked about in the last video, namely executive control. So executive control is something that's very general, and involved in several different cognitive activities. It is responsible for selective attention or inhibition of distractors. It's, responsible, it's involved in manipulating ideas in working memory. And so this is not really a language switch, it's something more general. And in the last video we talked about how bilinguals have a heightened ability of uh, executive control and switching between languages is one situation in which executive control is needed. That's why bilinguals are more trained with regard to these things and in the long run become better at ignoring distractors or focusing their attention on something that's important and disregarding something that's unimportant. So conclusion, no language switch, but we found corroborating evidence for the idea that executive control is heightened in bilinguals. Another question, do L1 and L2 use the same neural structures? Do they depend on the same neural circuits? Here's a study by Kim and colleagues who had people generate sentences, so people were asked to describe their daily experiences in the L1 and in the L2, and they were doing that in an fMRI machine, and the researchers measured uh, blood flow in late learners and in early learners and looked at differences that emerge. And you see here this picture of Broca's area in the late learner, uh, and you see those are sentence generations in the, <clears throat> in the native language. Here we have the second language, and you see those two are fairly distinct. Here we have an early learner, yeah, so a bilingual who has um, competence in Turkish and in English, and you see that there's a large common area. So late learners, tend to do things separately in Broca's area. Early learners have more of a common area, an overlapping area. So this points to different neural wirings processing language in 
early and late bilinguals, in particular, late learners tend to use different parts of Broca's area for speech generation. And you can imagine how this would be less efficient or, or more effortful than what it is that the early learners do. So they have one system that sort of fixes everything. And here we have two systems, each of which is struggling to get things done. Um, here's another study, this time Italian-German bilinguals who were asked to perform a grammaticality judgment test. So is uh, this sentence here a good sentence of German? Der Hund laufen über die Wiese. Well, those of you who speak a little bit of German, you know that, well, laufen is not the right verb form here. It should be läuft, uh, singular, laufen, that's plural. And so, no, this doesn't work. You should say, no, that's not a great sentence of German. Subjects were divided into three groups early learners with high proficiency, late learners with high proficiency, and late learners with low proficiency. And here you see the three different uh, types of responses. So um, the early learners with high proficiency, the late learners with high proficiency, and the late learners with low proficiency. And you see when you compare these three conditions, there's heightened activity in the late learners uh, regardless of proficiency. So in both of these groups, processing is characterized by more neural activity. So this tells us that it's actually more effortful. And this is quite commonsensical, right? So the early learners for them, it's easier to perform the grammaticality judgment task. It involves less neural activation than uh, what we see in the late learners. <clears throat> Okay, there's not only fMRI, there's also something called ERP that is frequently being used. ERP are event-related potentials, and um, they work like this. So people have a set of electrodes on their scalp, and these measure electrical brain activity. And there are two signatures that we need to talk about. One is called N400. N400, N stands for negative, 400 stands for 400 milliseconds. So an N400 is a negative electrical peak that occurs 400 milliseconds after a stimulus, namely a semantically odd word, something that does not quite work out in terms of meaning. So we have two uh, waveforms here, and uh, one is semantically okay, that's meaning number, uh, sentence number one, the pizza is too hot to eat. Yeah, semantically that's fine, nothing special here. Sentence two is weird. Uh, the pizza is too hot to sing. So here we have the onset of the uh, words eat and sing. And sing, the offending word, triggers an N400 400 milliseconds down the line. That's where you realize, well, pizzas don't sing, do they? Yeah? Uh, so this kind of thought process goes on. That's the N400. Mm, there's also something called a P600. By now you can figure out what P600 actually means. P stands for positive, 600, 600 milliseconds after an offending stimulus. So here again we have two sentences, one that is okay, the cat won't eat, nothing out of the ordinary, morphosyntactically, the cat won't eating, yeah, no, that's not English, that's word soup, yeah, the cat won't eating. So 600 milliseconds after eating, uh, there is a positive charge at the 600 millisecond mark. Okay, and this of course can be exploited for the analysis of language processing in bilinguals. Um, ERP is sort of complementary to fMRI. It has excellent temporal resolution, millisecond by millisecond, but in terms of space, ah, it has poor spatial resolution, so we don't know where exactly the electrical activity in the brain is happening. So that's why ERP and fMRI tend to be used alongside each other. Okay, here's a study on English-Spanish bilinguals that had to perform a grammaticality judgment task. So we're concerned with grammar, syntax, rather than meaning. So P600 is the name of the game here. And uh, they had native speakers of Spanish react to morphosyntactic violations with a particular ERP signature, they showed the P600, and the question was, do L2 learners of Spanish so show the same pattern of brain activity? So do also the learners show this uh, P600 signature when they process language? Uh, and so the, the first type of um, 
violation, the first type of syntactic mistake here, was a mismatch between uh, the article of the gender of an article and the noun that is associated with it. So it should be una fiesta, not un fiesta. Uh, that's wrong, that triggers a P600 in uh, Spanish monolinguals. Um, and it actually also triggers a P600 or something similar in L2 learners. So here you see different types of uh, stimuli and averages over them. So one wave, the bold, the black one, is the acceptable sentence, and then we have an unacceptable uh, variant of the same sentence. So the black that has the right determiner and the gray has the wrong determiner with the wrong gender. And you see that at the 600 millisecond mark, the unacceptable sentences tend to be above the acceptable sentences. So conclusion, L2 learners of Spanish show sensitivity to wrong gender determiners that can be measured in terms of a P600. Um, however, the experiment actually returned a mixed bag of results. There was another condition uh, that tested not for article headword mismatch, but rather um, uh, in terms of gender, but rather a mismatch in terms of number. Yeah, so here we have another violation that's rather similar. El niños, well, it, it should be, el is singular, niños is plural. That's a number mismatch. That doesn't work. There should be a plural determiner. Yeah, And uh, here you see in the results that, well, strangely enough, this didn't seem to offend as much as the gender mismatch. So here, learners of Spanish do not show a P600 sensitivity to wrong number determiners. So what this indicates is that the grammatical characteristics of the morphosyntactic violation, that actually matters, and not all uh, grammatical violations are registered in the same way by L2 learners. Here's another study, this time with English-speaking learners of French, and here we're entering semantic territory. So meaning is at issue here, so the N400 is the measure that is being used here. And an ERP was conducted in response to three classes of words. Uh, so this was a lexical decision task that people had to do, and at the same time uh, they were, <clears throat> um, well, uh, an ERP was conducted in three conditions. Um, first, a semantically related word uh, that was uh, related to a prime. So people saw the word chien as a prime and then had to respond to chat as the target. And of course, dog and cat, they are semantically related. So that's a semantic relation. Uh, then there were pairs of semantically unrelated words. Maison, house, soif, thirst. Um, maybe, well, when I get home, I'm usually thirsty, but the semantic relation is not as clear as with chien and chat. So, no, uh, semantically unrelated. And then the third condition involved a non-word. So, mo, that's an actual word, that means word. And nazier, that sounds very French. Oh, il est où le nazier? Huh? Um, but it's not a word. <clears throat> so, this should trigger a specific response. And uh, people were looking out for an N400, the signature that reflects semantic oddity and also lexical status. Yeah? So you find a strong N400 for stimuli that are semantically odd, and it's actually strongest for words that are not even words, where you try to find a meaning but can't find one because it's not in the mental lexicon and there's no meaning associated with it at all. Right, so what came out? There were two groups, uh, non-learners of French, so people who did not speak any French at all, and French learners, and they were subjected to this kind of experiment three times. Um, and, okay, session one, then um, a delay of several days, session two, same thing, and finally session three. And you see that for the non-learners, there is uh, no difference really between the three conditions and you wouldn't expect that so they don't know the meanings of chien and, and chat so they don't see the semantic relation between them uh, maison and soif same thing yeah to them it sounds french it's french and so nazier nothing special about that that could just sound 
like a French word, even though it isn't. Let's look at the French learners. So they expectedly show uh, an N400 that is strongest for the pseudo word target. So this is here the reaction to Nazier that is a clear offender and also the others um, show some little activity. But you see that that activity actually goes down for the related word target. So when two meanings are strongly related then there's no need for this negative 400 because there's nothing semantically odd, rather it's um, predictable that you would find this kind of semantic relation. Right, summing up for today, um, there are different brain areas involved in language. There's localization to a certain extent, but connectivity plays a strong role as well. We've talked about different methods that can be used to study processing in bilinguals using the methods of functional magnetic resonance imaging and event-related potentials. And that was it for this series, believe it or not. So glad you came along for the ride. It was a lot of fun. And I hope you keep reading on bilingualism, maybe go back to some of the studies in this book. It's a really good book. I can so recommend it. So um, you really should go and buy it. Yeah. All right, that's it. Au revoir. See you then. You know, there will be a next time for something, but I'm not sure what it is just yet. Okay, bye.